Hi guys. <laughs> this is Mike Royce. Hi. Mike has worked on such shows as <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean IMDb him. All right, he's a big deal. Yes. He got paired with me mm -hmm. to do One Day at a Time. Uh, we met in Norman Lear's office. Yes. And we got along. So we made One Day at a Time. So now we're going to go through sort of our process in uh, creating this pilot and how we broke it and what we talked about and how we got to where we got in the hopes that it will help you to put together your own pilots. So now we have this script. This is our shooting draft. It changed. Uh, yes. As we went. So we kind of sit down at the beginning and we sat down and we said, all right, what are the things from the original series that we want to keep? It was about a single mom. Uh, but then, and then immediately start, things started changing because then when you first met with Norman about your mom, mm -hmm. the mom character, because you said your mom, everyone says your mom looks like Rita Moreno. Rita Moreno. So we got Rita Moreno. Yeah, easy. Yeah, easy. easy. That was a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> Big, not by us. It was by Norman. She wouldn't Norman. have taken our calls. No. And then we, on the original show, there was uh, two teenage, tween teenage kids. And we, since we both have a boy and a girl, we wanted to change it. Yes. To, so we could relate. Uh, our stories. Put our own stories more in there. And also we felt like adding another female character, it might be cool to have another male character. Right. Uh, we knew we wanted to keep Schneider, some version of the original Schneider. Yes. That is the character that probably changed the most draft to draft. Yes. If you watch the very first episode of One Day at a Time, <laughs> the original, he, I'm going to say, breaks into their apartment. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and she's on the phone and she, he starts kissing her neck. Yeah. You know, there was not no consent, let's say. The 70s, man. It was the 70s. Uh, so we were not going to do that. We were not going to do that. No, but we were trying to find a way in which they had some chemistry. Yes. But never would, it would just always be a fun I guess, flirtation, but friendship. Right. But it never quite no. added up to... Every version we did with flirting or him being somewhat lecherous or hitting on her never felt right or modern to us. Right. And he felt extra to their world. It just felt like, oh, it's the old Schneider in this new world. Right. So how do we integrate him in? How do we make him part of their world? Right. Was the thing. And I think that's where the idea of making him an alcoholic who was in recovery, who was from somewhere else. At first he was gonna be sort of the ugly American, you know? Right, very opinionated. And then it felt like, oh, he's from privilege himself. He can be more the face of privilege. And I don't think it was until the fifth episode that we really decided he was gonna be Canadian. Right. right. So that was it. And we were also <coughs> playing with his look. In fact, if you look at the pilot of One Day at a Time, Schneider comes in and he's wearing uh, like a thermal. And that's because at one point we were thinking we were going to have him have sleeve tattoos. And then we thought about the makeup of that every day for a multi. And we're yeah. like, no, yeah. we don't need to do that. <laughs> As it kind of moved along, you know, you start with these initial thoughts of what you want to do, who you want these characters to be, and then how they fit together. And the privileged voice felt like that would be a voice that would be interesting to this immigrant family who's had to work for everything. Yes. Loving and being friends with somebody who came from privilege. That seemed like interesting conversation would come out of that. It, it's a good contrast to, uh, to what's happening with good the family. Good foil for the family. Yeah, but that took many steps of many drafts. I mean, if, if there's one thing I could say to the kids out there. Mm -hmm. um, Listen up, guys. No, it's be because we had to fail so many times with it. We had to have it read by actors who probably wish they had read the later version. I remember after the table read, too, we were still working with it, you know? It took a lot of times of going, oh, God, is this ever going to work? Right. You know. Then there was the character of Dr. Berkowitz. That character was very important to Norman. Yes. It's not something that we actually saw. I remember at some point he was like, the, he, the doctor that Penelope works with should be a character. It was a dentist. Started as a dentist. Started as a dentist. And she was going to be a hygienist, I guess. Yes. Well, then we started talking about the veteran aspect. Right. Right. Because Penelope didn't start out as the veteran. Her ex-husband started out. As the veteran. As the veteran. And then we quickly realized, why are we giving this very interesting perspective to a the lesser man. Kid, yeah, <laughs> to that's a man. Really, yeah, that really yeah. Was, it was. And right now, it does seem like something else that's very modern is women being in service and also these young people that are in the best shape of their lives meeting in service. Yeah, uh, it's just a good lesson because you're const sometimes you assign the most interesting things to you're finding yourself like to supporting characters. 
and it's it's really important that you make your main character as interesting as possible because that's the whole weight of the series is on them, you know. And, and then we realized that her being a nurse would be a little bit more interesting. Right, right. And a family practice would have reasons why our family could be there a little bit more than a dental hygienist. Yeah. Then Berkowitz sort of became, that took on some interesting. Yeah, he was always, we always, for some reason, his daughter's hating him <laughs> always, always was, was there. a constant. So that's how we started with the characters. And then it was about what are we writing about? It was hard, like how, now that you have the characters and you're like, okay, we know who these people are, what is the most interesting way to start this story and introduce, like why is today the day? Right. Why is today the day that we're meeting these characters on this day? And the quinceanera story was one that I told Norman when I first met with him. I did not have one because I had done some reading. There were many reasons <laughs> that I didn't have one. We had also just moved and uh, I was new to my high school and I wanted a car and I had read about sort of the background of debutante balls and coming out parties and all of this and the quinceanera was the version of that for my community. And I was like, you yeah, know, it's what? Like, oh, this is, here she is. We put some lipstick on her. Anyone interested? <laughs> it was just, it seemed so anti-feminist. And then also so much money. I'd seen so many families go into debt for their kids' quinces. And we had just moved. It was just all these reasons why I thought, no. And I promised my parents a huge Catholic wedding, which I gave them. I did not have a quinceanera. Norman thought that was interesting. And we thought maybe that would be the way in. Yeah, and everything that, you just said is like, I mean, half of that stuff's just in the show verbatim. <laughs> you know, right, in other right, words, right. like those, all those reasons for not having a quinceanera the, immediately became Elena's argument. Right. And I just remember a lot of writing the pilot and coming up with the stuff is, you know, for, that you're going to write towards is you, you have to find moments that you want and sort of head towards those things. And then the sort of out of the moments come scenes, you know, so that argument about the quinceanera, you also threw in how do we have this debate about it because the show is best when the three main characters have of different perspective, all one different angle. So Penelope, often Penelope is in the middle, but that doesn't mean she doesn't have a perspective. Right. You know, Penelope was the one who's like, which she says at the end, I get why you don't want to have this for your reasons, but I don't want you to throw out like all everything. There are good traditions, there's good thing, you can make the tradition your own. And so then obviously Lydia coming from a very traditional and, uh, viewpoint and Elena coming from a very non-traditional viewpoint felt like a good, how do, now how do we have that debate? And you proposed something, I don't know how it came out, but the Lincoln Douglas. The Lincoln Douglas debate. Yeah, which was perfect. Like wh often when you're writing, you look for what's called a game. You know, there's a game in the scene. That's mostly for comedy, but the game refers to a conceit, like a, a premise that you can kind of get a lot of jokes out of, but also that is, you know, getting the information across. So that debate was a perfect framework to like, you know, have a lot of fun uh, and, and, and yet, and get everybody's viewpoint, you know? Yeah. Schneider, she's gonna do it, I got this. You know what, Captain Debater? Let's debate this. But we're not doing a regular debate. It's gotta be that thing I saw you do where we argue the opposite side to better understand each other. You mean a Lincoln-Douglas debate, my specialty? I once successfully argued against gravity, so... Ooh, I'm gonna take my earring off. Because <laughs> it's about to go down! <laughs> and then what is very interesting, so the very first scene of the pilot, you have to give the audience, like, here's all the information you need to know to enjoy this journey you're about to go on. And that's one of the hardest things about writing a pilot, is how do you as elegantly as possible, get out all of this backstory so that we can latch onto these characters and go on this ride. And we did a scene, it's often so much easier to do it with like a stranger. Like if it's like the first day that this person's working at the bar and they're meeting everyone, they become the voice of the audience, you know, asking, sto asking story questions and character questions. Yeah. So we had this scene that actually Norman ended up wanting us to cut, we didn't. <laughs> yeah, and there was a re good reason because yes, yes, we we started in this office where we're hardly ever for the rest of the series. He wanted to start in the house, so did we. But we needed to know all the information about who she was, right. so that we could go on the ride of the rest of the show. And often, what happens in there's a lot of bad ways to do it, and I'm not saying we're immune to it. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of uh, 
Uh, how many times have I told you that? I'm your sister. Right. You oh, know, no. bad dialogue. There was literally a show, I will not name it, where it was like, I'm a chef, you're a movie critic. We just don't get along. I mean, it was literally, <laughs> Right. <laughs> you can now figure out which show that was. But that's the thing is, <laughs> y y the trick is to avoid completely explanatory dialogue. The dialogue has to be interesting. You know, on Everybody Loves Raymond, you love when I tell Everybody Loves Raymond yes. stories. Phil Rosenthal, you know, he would always say, you have to make the setup funny. You have to make them not even know that they're being set up. So you have to make something that's interesting to watch that still is getting information across that will be important later. So mm. we start in at her workplace. We get all of this information. She's a nurse. She was in the army. She's recently divorced. She has two kids. Her mother lives with her. All of this stuff we got out so that by the time she comes home and walks into her apartment, we know all of that and we know who this woman is and we know that it's going to be told through her point of view and then we can enjoy the rest of the show. We kept that scene and we tried to make it as short as possible. I think it ended up being, well, let's see, because here we go. We're gonna go through our pilot. There's also so scene A is five pages. That's pretty short, because this is double spaced. <clears throat> so yeah, so this first scene happens in Dr. Berkowitz's office, and this is our big pipe laying scene with the lovely character of Carl. We did it in terms of scenes, but this could also technically be called a cold open. Do you want to talk about the difference between a cold open and a teaser? Oh, I don't, is there a difference? No, they're the same There's thing. There's no difference. There's it's no the difference. They, it's the same thing. Yeah. Cold open and teaser's the same thing. But also scene A, it's just parts. Well, because this is on Netflix, it, it we everything flows and there's no commercials. So teaser or cold, cold open refers to the usually short scene that comes before the main credits slash commercial and then the rest of the show starts after it. Right. You know, Brooklyn Nine-Nine has the best they cold They have the opens. best cold opens. They, it's, it's always something joke. hilarious. It's something super funny. It might not even have to do with the plot at all. Right. Like we usually start, we always start story in our first scene. There's styles where the best version is when it does have something to do with the story, but yeah. often you just want two minutes of hilarity to get people like, oh, my show's on. And some, so sometimes you can just have a completely unstory related fun scene and then have the credits and the commercial and then start the story proper. Right. You know? Right. But the goal should be that it's connected to the story. All right, so that's five pages of just uh, set up, set up. This is who she is. This is what her life is. Then scene B is in the apartment, and this is where we meet all the main characters. So it's also the first time, I always remember some teacher of mine in the past said something about the first time in a play where you meet a character. Mm -hmm. Their opening line and what it says about them. Mm -hmm. And really, <laughs> Lydia's... Is is the most the epic. Best. Yeah. <laughs> Her, we have a problem, and this, the, the we curtain have a swinging that over. Is, it's pretty perfect. The fact that the curtain is even in the show came out of trying to make sure that we believe that this family lives in an apartment that they can fit into, that they can also afford, right? And Gloria said, well, I mean, I would just have, you know, but, but it's a lot of people, and like an, almost any version of the apartment would have to be under rent control for that many people and where right. they live. Because it's, it's a three bedroom. I mean, Elena and Alex have their own room and Penelope has her own room. Yeah. To have a four bedroom in Echo Park, it just seemed like there's no way that they'd be able to afford it unless they had it forever. Right. And then when would they have gotten it? It, it just it unraveled a bunch of things. So we felt like a three and one was feasible but let's turn that dining room into a bedroom. Yeah, well, she, and she, you said that, you know, well, I, I know if my mom moved into me, moved in with me in this situation, we'd just put her in the, the dining room and put, put up a, a curtain, curtain, and she would just be fine with that. Yeah, you know? yeah. It didn't come from, let's have Rita Marino enter through a curtain, but that's what it turned into, which was fantastic. <laughs> If you're thinking about your set, if you're thinking about your plan of where do these people live and reside, there might be comedy there as well. So it's, I think if you can think about that, it can sometimes infuse the material with a lot. The other thing is we decided to stick with a version of the original uh, set. So it's sort of an homage to the original set and it's a very proscenium, you know, the living room goes into the kitchen and then there's that great hallway as well. And then there's Lydia's room. So you can play a lot in the dimensions of that set. And that set is pretty common if you look at multicammed. So then in this B scene, which is 11 pages, mm -hmm. we like to do those long, page. we like that. Mm -hmm. We <laughs> go through and everyone gets to, you get to meet everyone. That's really what happens here. Writing wise, this was maybe the trickiest because now we're meeting everybody. So you have to 
you know, what are they doing that isn't just, hey, I'm the sun and I like looking in the mirror or whatever. Right, right, right. But for Penelope, what is her drive? You know, like the main character, what, is, what does she want? So we worked really hard to establish she's trying to keep her family together as a family since the divorce. Right. So just that little thing of having dinner became important to her. Yes, scene A, five pages, establishes Penelope's job and we get Penelope's backstory. Scene B, 11 pages, establishes the Alvarez home life, their relationships to one another. We meet Alex, Liddy, and Elena, and we see the beginnings of conflict between Penelope and Elena regarding the Quinces. So that's mm -hmm. really what yeah. shoots our A story off. And Penelope and Lydia, I would add. Yes, it's true. The, it's know, true. And then Alex Victor. is sort of there. Yeah. Then C, the C scene is when we meet Schneider. Yes. There was a lot of discussion 100 about- 100 versions of this one scene. Hundred versions of this scene. <laughs> Meeting Schneider and what Schneider says and what their interaction was. Oh my God, there was so much. There was a whole thing about her being on a dating app at one oh point. Oh my gosh, that's right. Where she was, he caught her being on a dating app and then was like, why, you know, why are you gonna go for takeout when there's someone right in the building I or know. whatever, stuff this like that. I know, he was know. still hitting on her and then we <laughs> abandoned all of that. We wanted to do an homage to the original Schneider who did have a very iconic mustache. But in that scene, in scene C, also 11 pages. These are long because this is Netflix, but it's okay for your first draft to be long because you can make cuts as you go. Yes. So we meet Schneider, we establish relationship with Penelope. We also have that great scene in the kitchen, which I really like where he's like, she's like, you've been hanging out here a lot. And he's like, yeah, yeah I like it too. Yeah. That I, tells us everything we need to know in a couplet. It does. Find out Penelope's taking antidepressants. We wanted to start the series off with that. We knew mental health was something we were gonna talk about in series. Yeah. Uh, so we just get to hint at it there. And then we get Lydia trying to convince Elena to have the keen cyst, and then we have the big debate. So that was a big scene. That was a big, a yeah. lot happens in there. Yeah. Everyone's there and that's really our C scene is where we establish like this is what the show is. It's these people. This is the kind of conversations they're gonna yeah, be Yeah, the whole group is together. The whole group is together <coughs> commenting and being funny. The D scene is when we meet Dr. Berkowitz for the first time. And it is great because it has jokes and establishes their friendship. Right. Very paternal type of relationship. And also we get to have a, a sincere conversation about the antidepressants, which establishes who they are to one another. It's more than just a bumbling doctor, he has, right. there's more there there with Dr. Berkowitz. You know, he was half of the teaser at one point because he comes in, oh, right. my phone's telling me things. Yes, and like, yes, yes. Uh, we sort of get, we got introduced to, to Dr. Berkowitz in the first scene initially, then we realized partly because Norman wanted to cut it, well, we don't need to meet him yet. He's not actually, we can meet him later. Right. So it's more about getting her information and then. And you'll, as you go, you'll see again and again, like it, it is good to go through and say, what can I cut? Yes. What can I, what absolutely has to stay? There is a good version of doing that where you can really distill it down to what are the really essential things you need in this pilot. We find out more about the p mental health stuff and how she feels about it and how her personal POV being a Latina woman has messed with her ability to <laughs> yeah. make decisions about this because it's a, it's a cultural issue as well. And then we see Alex order sneakers against Penelope's wishes. We right. get that alert on the phone. Yes, the alert, yes, yes. Um, okay, which, so four pages, it's a quick scene. Yeah. A lot happens in there. Efficient. Efficient. So the E scene is eight pages. This is when Penelope finds out about Alex's scheme. She talks to him about the importance of money and spending and being honest. Yes. And Elena shows up and she shows Penelope failing, her failing test. Oh, that's right. Yeah. This is when she's like, I'm not gonna do great, how about that? Right, this right. This is her whole thing. Yeah. And then Penelope loses her mind, <laughs> as one would. And then Penelope tells Lydia about the antidepressants and that doesn't go as she had hoped either. So this is really the all is lost scene where nothing is going right. She is losing her want at the beginning of the, of the episode. She's not getting anything she wants. In fact, it's worse, it's all imploding. Yes, everything's imploding. This is where she, and then you know, at the end, of course, she gets reassurance from Lydia. Her whole world is falling apart because her son's not listening to her. Her daughter's not listening to her. I mean, she's basically failing as a parent, right. according to, to what herself. she's yeah. set up. And she's got Lydia also kind of saying you're failing as a parent, even though Lydia doesn't mean to say that. Right. In, in this, the big speech at the end. With so, the big, wonderful speech, <laughs> which we love between them. And this is what I say about looking for moments, because I know, I remember you, we settled on 
her finally being pushed to say, hey, I miss him too. Like, don't get on me about, I should have my husband back. This is hard enough. Like, I already miss him. It's hard enough to get away. We thought that was a good moment to shoot for. So this scene was always headed there. But then it was like, then what else does she say? And I believe you stood in my office and monologued. Yeah, <laughs> Quite I a like bit. to talk out loud as the characters. I think it's helped. You do that too. Yeah, we'll do that sometimes. We'll go back and forth. Sometimes through monologuing, it helps me to just get to the other side of what I'm trying to say, and in there will be something good. So Mike also records us a lot, which I think is really helpful. Sometimes it might be great for you to just set your phone on record and start talking through as the character and see if there's any gems in there that are like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I'll keep that and trim away all the other stuff. And yeah. then you can transcribe that sometimes, which can be really helpful. For sure, for sure. Because that's, you came, you got to, I got you. So you just said it very casually. Like sometimes you just need somebody to give you a hug and say, I got you, you know? And I, I mean, I don't know if you realize how great it was, but I did. <laughs> that's why it's great. Listen, Mike is really here just to tell me that I'm great. I mean, there are worse jobs. The recording thing is very helpful, and Norman Lear himself said he became a writer because he finally started recording himself instead of sitting in front of the blank page getting stuck. That he recorded his ideas and then he would transcribe them, and it's a very helpful thing. I find it very helpful. Yeah, no, it's really, really great. Then we have our H scene, which now we're in resolution, right? She, the character sort of had her cathartic moment. Her mother comes to her side and says, don't worry, I'm here for you. Whatever the world's gonna throw at us, you're not alone, right? So that once she's calmed down, she goes and speaks to Elena, and they come to a resolution about the Kinsis. And then Elena, to her surprise, agrees to have one for the purposes of lifting up her single mother and showing everybody that she's amazing. Alex is wearing the old shoes, but Penelope presents him with one pair of shoes. That's right, that's our J scene, which is three pages. And then the very end is Lydia comes in to spoon Penelope. And that's our pilot. That's the pilot. That's the pilot. Yeah. I think as long right. as you're building towards a character has a clear want, why is today the day? What is the inciting incident? What is the progressive complication of that? What is your midpoint? Yeah. Your, your conflict and resolution. You know, your all is lost and then your resolution. That's if you're, yeah, if you're writing your own yeah. thing, right. Which if is what doing they're a, doing. They're gonna be writing oh, pilots. Yes. So that's the pilot process. That's the one day at a time pilot. We walked through, we told you what that was about. Right? It's on, it's on Netflix. It's on Netflix, check it out. When we wrote the pilot, we knew the types of stories we wanted to tell. Yeah. We didn't know exactly what those were going to be. We knew that by establishing these characters, there was an organic way that already existed in the framework of the show, which was Lydia is traditional, Penelope is a moderate, and, and Elena is a liberal. So we, we knew we always had that, so for conversation, bring up any topic and you want to hear what those point of views are. Yes, yes. That's true to their character. And I think one of my favorite episodes is still uh, No Mas, which is the church episode where Penelope doesn't want to go to church anymore and her mother thinks she should and Elena thinks it's all nonsense. And they all get to talk about it. And at the end, nobody has changed anybody's mind, but they've all heard one another and move on in a respectful and loving place. And I think that's when it was like, oh, that's what we're doing. Yes. Let's, let's continue doing stories that are that. We didn't know exactly where it was gonna go. We didn't know exactly what the journey was gonna be, but we knew the types of episodes we were gonna be writing. And sitcoms, multi-camera sitcoms especially, are mostly conversation. The plot has to be surprising, because otherwise it's just conversation with no without purpose. no purpose, right? You can watch a talk show for that and it's a different animal. Right. But it's mostly conversations, so the conversations have to be um, important to the characters because that's how you're following the story. We, we certainly don't have like, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, seasons four, five, six, because it's mostly about how they're living their lives and the conversations about that. Right, what I do think was super valuable when I was starting out is I watched a ton of pilots. And it's also interesting to see how pilots change. Like, I was obsessed with Sex and the City, I love that show. The pilot is so different from what the series ended up being. They used to do direct address to the camera, like Carrie and all the characters would talk to camera. Yeah. And then they would have sort of man on the street talking to camera as well they completely abandoned that because they were like, we don't need that, it's not working. The Friends pilot is incredible because in writer's rooms, we say things and I didn't know all of those things were, like I'm switching you to decaf is in the Friends pilot. 
Right. You know, like all of those like <laughs> tropes, things that like you say, nobody says that now. All of that stuff I think they started from, yeah. and came from that Friends pilot. So watch those and see how they introduce characters. I think that can be super instructive in realizing the first thing they say, the the most concise way of getting the character information out. I think like was the was the fruit bowl was the fruit in the pilot of Raymond? No, that's so that's a good example but of that's such a great character thing. Right. Of character being more important than plot. And I, it's, it breaks the rules but in a reason for a reason that's good. But everyone goes Raymond pilot is basically Ray's parents come over too much. It's Deborah's birthday. He tries to tell them not to come over. They come over anyway. He, then he says you can't come over anymore and that's the whole I mean that's the show. Um, and then they come over every other episode. <laughs> uh, but in the middle of it, he goes over to his mom's to, 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 to I tell her something, and they just have a whole tangent because he got her a gift of fruit of the month, and she hates it because fruit's coming every month, and we can buy our own fruit, and who are you to give us gifts? And it all becomes parental, you know, crapping on your gift, and came right out of Phil Rosenthal's life, literally the conversation, like it's almost verbatim that he had with his mom. And it so reveals their relationship and the parents' characters that it was totally worth keeping in, even though the story has nothing to do with it. So it's, it's a good example of like, if you're gonna do that, it better be worth it. It's gotta be worth it. And then of course, long story short, is that's the one thing people remember from it's that pilot. It's so <laughs> funny. Thank you so much for watching. It's not over here, you guys. You can still tweet me at Everything Gloria. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter. I'm still available to you. So keep asking those questions, keep doing the work. Make sure to watch all of the other Hollywood 101 videos on Beto Likes' YouTube channel. This is Gloria Calderon-Kellett. Good luck.